Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. So we'll go ahead and get started here. And um hope everybody had a good weekend. So I just want to point out real, uh, real quick here. I just want to take a quick look at the syllabus and uh, pull it up on the screen here. And uh, we're a little bit behind, behind the pace. Really worried about it's nothing that I think you should be worried about either. Um, because we are we're covering chapter 10 and I hope you get through all of it last time, last week, and we we didn't, but that's that's okay. I think we're in okay shape. We're going to cover just the, the last bit of chapter 10 today, which deals with oligopoly. We talked a bit about it on, on Wednesday, and we'll cover it in more detail today. We'll talk about what oligopoly is, why it's interesting in, in some ways, because I think it really sort of forms a lot of the basis for how we think about big business. And when we talk about oligopoly, the thing that we should remember is that we're talking about big business rather than, than, than four veterinarians in a small town that not really be uh, an oligopoly. We're talking about much more of a uh, national presence. Chapter 11 deals with some of the legal issues regarding this idea of industry concentration. We're going to get into that, what we call antitrust. And so uh, my objective here is, I think, I know it was a fairly good thing to get through chapter 14 before the third exam. And if you take a look here, um, um, I, I think we're going to probably get through 10 and probably most of 11 today, if not all of it. And uh, then we'll pick up beginning on Wednesday, um, section known as market structure. And we'll be dealing with um, a, an area of microeconomics that we call externalities. Externalities, and, and there'll be some, some issues which we'll have to do, some new definitions, different types of goods that we, we bring in. But we'll talk a bit about externalities, what they are, because up until this point, we've talked about the idea that, that private transactions simply impact only the buyer and seller and, and people directly connected to, a, to an economic event. And, and very clearly, that, that a lot of economic events have what we call spillover effects. They affect others outside of the transaction. So 12 and 13 deal with that. I don't know that we're going to get to 14 prior to the first to the third exam, but we'll see how we'll see how things go. It looks like we actually uh, uh oh no it looks like, well maybe we will then okay so maybe 14 is not I was looking at this wrong when I when I, for, I think I skipped over looking at the uh, the third exam there. So well I think then if that's the case I think we are in better shape than what I initially thought as I was preparing for class this morning. So, okay, well, I think we have just a bit of 10, 11, 12, 13. 11 is a fairly brief chapter, and I think it's relatively straightforward. By the way, I think that one thing that I could say is that once we get through chapter nine, I think that that is probably the most complex chapter in a lot of ways, because it deals with this idea of interactions among costs and, uh, and whatnot, marginal cost and, and all these kinds of things. And the impact on marginal cost on variable and average variable and average uh, variable average variable cost average total cost and so I think once we get uh, once we got beyond that I think we're uh, straightforward and less uh, complex but we'll still be using models and graphs in order to illustrate some of these uh, relationships okay so are there questions for me about anything as to where we are in the class where we're going etc. Well, okay. Well, let's talk about this idea of only God. This is where we left off last time. We were talking about the, the final structure here, which is only God. Okay. And um, so remember, we have four market structures that we're talking about when we talk about the supply side of markets. And that is the, the, the that block in the circular flow model that we refer to as firms. And perfect competition, monopoly, monopolistic competition. And oligopoly. And so now we're on the last of these oligopoly. Oligopoly, in some ways, is kind of a, a unique and uh, figure because it really constitutes a lot of the firms that we are very familiar with in terms of, of big business firms. Um, monopolistic competition might have a lot of the brands that we're familiar with, but oligopoly contains a lot of the firms that we are familiar with. And again, it's not so much well, monopolistic competition, maybe one of the only structures in which the, the, the type of product is so critical in understanding the good because it really takes it out of the realm of perfect competition and gives it a little bit of monopoly pricing power to the extent that somebody has maybe a patent protection or a strong brand. Otherwise, it would just sort of devolve into very, uh, a perfectly competitive industry. Uh, the other structure really had more less to do with product and more with structure. And that is the idea, how is this industry organized? And once we know how it's organized, then we know how it behaves and so we, we, we deal with things that we call structure, conduct, and performance. Structure, conduct, and performance. The structure determines the conduct, that is how firms behave, that is between themselves, among themselves, and also toward, the, toward buyers, toward the government, toward society in general. And, uh, 
And so I think that's a really interesting thing for us to look about. So what's the definition of market structure characterized by only a few firms supplying the bulk of the quantity of the market? So when we say a few firms, I think on, two, on Wednesday, I think I talked about the idea that um, these few firms, it's not particularly well defined. I understand that, but, I, but we'll get into some measures here a bit later that will sort of help to maybe clarify the fact that you can't simply have 100 firms and call that an oligopoly. And it just doesn't make sense once we start getting into how we measure relative market strength. Um, it can be as small as two. We talked about the idea of a duopoly being two firms. And one of the classic examples over in our history, in the US history, was Coke and Pepsi going at it as the two major firms for a long time. I don't know that, that market could really be characterized by two firms now because there's so many other entrants in that market, but that would be an example. Uh, probably worldwide, the, big, the best example is probably Boeing and Airbus. And I, I, I can't recall, I don't think your text, some texts do, but some texts do not. I think yours does not have a discussion of the duopoly relationship, which is just a unique form of, of, of oligopoly where firms are watching each other and they're, 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 they're paying attention to what each other does. And it's, it's very easy to do because they're only two competitors. That's really one of the, those are some of the characteristics of oligopolies. First of all, and I, I, I think we just got into this a bit last time, and a little bit, and I'll continue this. I don't want to spend a ton of time on this because I know I've covered some of this, but this idea of, of strategically interdependent. This is, a, this is what makes this uh, different from the others because structure determines conduct and then conduct determines performance. And that is if you're strategically interdependent, you're watching what each other does. And I gave the example of of broadcasting as being an example of, I'm talking about national broadcasting as being an example of oligopoly, and that is leading and following. Now, we typically think of leading and following from a formal definition of being a leading firm in terms of price and following firms in terms of price. And that is true. And the example I gave you last time was that the airline industry, that is, if one airline changes its fares, everybody else changes theirs like instantaneously within minutes. And I, I said, you know, just plug in, if you want any evidence of that, just go out to Expedia or Priceline or any of these, these travel sites and put in a, 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 just a hypothetical um, uh, destination and you'll get the exact same price if it's around the same time. Different times a day, you're going to get different prices, but I mean, it's not close, it's the exact same price. And, and that's because the form of the product is really irrelevant here. It's the structure that really determines it. And you can have branded products in oligopolies, that is true. Uh, but that, the brand is not what defines it as it does in monopolistic competition, because we're saying that there could be a, a fairly long run condition of, of, of economic profit. Firms are competitive with each other and often very intensely. In other words, they're not cartels. I talked just a little bit about cartels last time. And what did I say? I said, cartels, we have this, I think we're not very well served by the news media when they talk about cartels, because we seem to think of these as being um, dealing in illegal activities like drugs. And that's not really what a cartel is. And in fact, I don't even think that these Colombian and Mexican drug organizations are really actually cartels. I mean, they're, they're uh, I, mean, I don't know what makes them a cartel because the cartel is a cooperative group of producers. Producers who get together to agree on price, output, territories, distributions, customer lists, all those kinds of things. So these firms are competitive they can't do that. So if firms get together and try to, to agree on, hey, I'll lower my price and you lower your price, or I'll raise mine, you raise yours, that's the illegal activity. And by the way, this has happened before. And if you take the example of nothing other than the airline industry, there was uh, the, the, the FBI was investigating the airline industry uh, several years ago, and, and American Airlines chairman, who's, I think his name was Bob Kramer, uh, was, on, was on the phone with United Airlines CEO, and he said, well, I just raise my prices and you raise yours, and it won't be done with this, these price wars. And the United CEO was aghast. He said, you know, we can't talk about price. Hung up, and he, I think, suspected something was really wrong there. And, uh, and there was, because the government was listening. Uh, I don't think anything happened to America because they didn't. Well, you could argue they made a conspiracy to do it or attempted a conspiracy to do it, and I have no doubt that they would have gone along with it. And uh, so... And there's a reason why monop either both monopolistically competitive firms and perfectly competitive firms can't do it because there are too many competitors. You simply can't get every wheat farm in the United States together in the Superdome in, in New Orleans and say, okay, let's agree on price and output. Just, it just doesn't work that way. I mean, you're talking about thousands, tens of thousands, right, of producers. And how would that work? And, and, and even, by the way, the cartels, the, the cooperative groups of producers, you have cheaters because when the price goes up because they're restricted supply, and you have somebody saying, hey, I'll just 
produce more, take advantage of the high price, at least the time that I can get it, or the extra supply brings the price down. And so they've been they cheated. And the OPEC oil cartels had this cheating problem for decades. They can't keep their members in line. So how would you expect tens of thousands of wheat producers or even 12 producers of uh, shampoos to, to agree or detergents or toothpaste to agree on price and output? It's just is too, it's too hard to do. So these firms are competitive, and but there are a few of them. So the possibility is what we call collusion is very high. The possibilities for collusion is very high. We've seen examples of collusion happening and when it does happen, it is considered to be illegal. Fairs to entry days are high. This is one of the explanations for why there are only a few firms. It's just too difficult to get into some industries. By the way, the U.S. auto industry, I was having a conversation a couple of weeks with somebody on this, that the U.S. auto industry used to be almost the perfect example, even when I started teaching, uh, the perfect example of an oligopoly industry. You had three major competitors in the U.S. And yes, you had lots of different brands within those, like you had Pontiac and Oldsmobile and Chevrolet and GMC all with under one firm. And then you go to the next firm, Ford, they've got Mercury, Ford, Lincoln, and all that. But again, there were only three major firms that were beating each other's brains out. And they were very competitive with one another, but they didn't copy each other. They, once one came up with a fuel efficient car, the rest did. Um, when one came up with uh, employee pricing, everybody else did. They copied that right away. When one got a finance arm to, to as consumer finance, the rest of them did. They followed suit. The problem with that is it's really broken down. You've got so many competitors now, and it's really hard to say that the that the, the auto industry is oligopolistic. Even though I think I've got it listed there as one of the one of the examples. Okay, products going to be similar, but nearly identical. I know I'm, I'm sort of going back over this, but I I do want to sort of wrap this up. I just want to make sure everyone has got all this. The kinds of scale and prevalent, and also heavily regulated. We're going to pick up on the regulation piece a bit more on um, a bit later in the class today. So what can we say about this? So firms are large. And we say they're, they're, they're considered to be part of big business. They often have diversified operations. They also experience the negative price effect. And by the way, this negative price effect is this distinguishing characteristic between these three structures, which call them, which are sort of informally grouped together as imperfectly competitive versus perfectly competitive, where marginal revenue does not diminish over time as you produce more output. You can produce all the output you want. It makes no difference on the price of the product. And hence the revenue you will earn because you simply are a price taker. In this case, if you overproduce, you bring the price down. So there is every incentive to try to control price and output. And the profit is possibly short run and often in the long run. And then one of the things that we've talked about before is the idea that profit maximizing quantities where um, marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And I think I got into the diagrammatics of that on Wednesday. And then finally, what some of the examples are. So we talked about this idea. And I, I even have autos as the first. And I'm on here, so I, and I don't know. I'm just giving you a sort of a question mark. I certainly wouldn't ask you a question on the exam about that, but uh, it's it's a question mark. We all these others, motorcycles, jet skis, breakfast cereals, very oligopolistic. Kellogg, Post, Quaker, um, soft drinks, cigarettes, uh, beer and liquor. All these really are considered to be major uh, major major examples of these. And one thing I'll talk about that I didn't get to last time was this idea of. Sometimes they ask, okay, two to 12 maybe is what you're saying for an oligopoly. One is a, is a monopoly. Beyond 12 is something else. It's either perfect competition or monopolistic competition. So is, if, is 12 really the outside number? And I'm saying, no, not really. But it really depends upon how strong the biggest one or two are, because we'll talk about what's what moves the needle in terms of market power. But think about this. In so many industries, with consolidation as firms buying each other up, and they've been doing it forever, since the beginning of industrialization, firms are buying each other, snapping each other up. This magic number of four seems to be where a lot of industries are settling in. And there's and, and, and you can't get too fewer than that in some cases, because otherwise it sort of pushes the needle over. And I'll talk about it here in a minute. That talks about that, that, that indicates that the industry is too concentrated. There's too much market power on the supply side. Think about this. We've got four major railroads in this country: Union Pacific, Southern Pacific, Burlington Northern, Santa Fe. And Norfolk Southern, and that's and they're a small. There's there's a Kansas Southern. It's a very small air. Uh, I was going to say airline. Very small railroad doesn't really move the needle, and we'll see how needle does the needle does not move the tiny market shares. But there's there are four, and that's really it. Um, there are four major accounting firms: Deloitte and Touche, KPMG, Price Scoopers, and 
Ernst and & Young, and there are a lot of small firms, but they don't move the needle. That, and that industry used to have, when I was in an undergraduate, I think there were, they called them the big eight, then the big six, then the big five, that's the big four. And I don't think the problem will get any smaller than that. Um, think about a lot of industries in which there are just four major competitors. And, and it really does seem to be, there are four major banks in the country. By the way, we're all, if you watch any kind of business news, or even just about banks the last three or four days, to the point where I'm really tired of hearing about it. But you know, the idea was that yeah, people were saying that, well, it's not going to extend to the big banks. This is not a contagious situation. And I don't know that we really pieced together what is going on with this Silicon Valley bank. I never thought it was much of a bank to begin with. I know stock analysts have been promoting it for years. And I, when I looked at it, I never thought it was much of anything. But the fact that they've got tight, they've got some connection to crypto already raises my suspicions. But we'll find out more about it. The thing about banking, though, there are, only, there are four major banks in this country, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citibank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, those are the four big ones. And yes, there are a lot of smaller or bigger, big, big, big regional banks like U.S. Bank and, you know, things like that. But uh, those are, you know, and, and Compass Bank and whatnot, but, but they're not anywhere near as big as those. And so that does seem to be a natural sort of place in which these are, are sort of fitting in here, okay? So that number four does seem to be kind of interesting, okay? All right, questions about that. I know that we talked a lot about it. There's not really that much to talk about in terms of the characteristics because of the fact that we talked a lot about it last time. One thing that I wanted to, to talk about, and your, your text gets into it a little bit, and almost all econ micro textbooks will get into this idea of something unique about oligopoly and pricing. And it's got to do with something called the kinked demand curve. So if you think about, so think about it. Now, this is, and I'll tell you right at the outset, this is theoretical. Not everybody really buys this. And so if you're wondering why am I teaching something that's theoretical, well, because there's theory involved here. So, but if you take a look at, at all pretty much all of the monopolist or imperfectly competitive structures where you've got a marginal cost curve, supply marginal cost, and you've got a, you've got a demand curve looks like that, and you know, a marginal revenue curve looks like that, right? And we see that firms will, um, will, will produce output where marginal revenue is marginal cost. That's the profit maximizing quantity. And then it'll just simply mark up the price of the good to whatever the demand side is willing to pay for it. So we get a monopoly price and the quantity that the monopoly quantity is the profit maximizing, should be monopoly price, the profit maximizing quantity and the profit maximizing price. Well, here's a little bit of something theoretical about oligopolies which sort of explains their behavior in terms of leading and following, because sometimes it, it seems pretty obvious when we say, well, the firm changes its prices, but everyone reacts the same, but there's an economic reason behind it. And that has to do with something, uh, this issue of what's called the kinked demand curve. The demand curve is thought to have a kink in it. And some people don't like the idea of a kink because it sort of violates this sort of idea of mathematics that, Mathematic functions don't usually accommodate hard corners and, and sharp turns. It's what's called an ill-behaved function. So how could this be a functional relationship? In other words, what it means is there's a broken marginal revenue curve is what's happening. And so as a result, the equilibrium price that should be charged is this price right here. And that any attempts to raise the price are considered to be futile because why would a firm raise a price in the inelastic region of demand or marginal revenue, right? Why would, you, why would you want to do that? And as a result, that price doesn't stick in it, and it simply comes back in the other direction. So why, or I'm sorry, why would you want to raise price in the elastic portion of the demand curve? It's elastic, if you raise the price, you lose revenue. On the other hand, if you low, why would you lower the price in the inelastic portion of the demand curve? You wouldn't want to do that either. And so as a result, there is a natural price, at least in the short run. And again, these short run graphs I've said it again and again for weeks, and you simply you want to take a picture of them because they are going to change. So it has to do with elasticity and the fact that there is some point at which there are substitutes available and people can pop out and go other places, but you would not want to raise the price when the, when the demand is elastic because that lowers revenue. Why? Because the, then the quantity effect uh, outweighs the price effect. On the other hand, you wouldn't want to lower the price when the uh, the main curve is inelastic because that there the price effect overwhelms the output effect and so you lose revenue in both cases. In both cases, you lose revenue by the raising price or lowering the price. 
So this is thought to be a natural price that is thought to be something that is, is sort of baked into the, to the, to the issue. The idea that there is some sort of kink. Now, that, well, I'll tell you this, that, that not only economists agree on this issue, it's a little bit, uh, it, it, it's a little bit controversial, but I bring it up only because of the fact it just comes up again and again and again. I know a lot of students, uh, particularly since our, our, resources, our resources for this class are online resources, well, a lot of times sort of knock on doors on the internet and they'll see this brought up and it is sort of a thing. And um, I know that, that uh, you know, some instructors just don't buy it at all. And so try to stay away from it to the extent that they, that they can. So uh, anyway, that's the idea of the kink the bank curve. It's, it's simply unique to oligopolistic industries, okay? And then, you know, I think there's a lot of discussion that you also run into about game theory. And I don't get into game theory in this class. I just, number one, I don't really have time. Number two, I think it's it's probably a bit beyond where we want to go in, in an introductory class. But game theory really probably comes originally from the military. And that was the idea that if my opponent does this, then what do I do? Then if I do that, what's the, what's the action, reaction, counteraction, next action, all these. And it sort of worked its way over to the economics realm. And there are a lot of people who do this idea of sort of gaming out these relationships. And I bring up the duopoly a little bit earlier because the fact that that's one of the most famous examples of a of what's called the prisoner's dilemma, where you've got two firms, and what, if they cooperate together, as they work together, they're better off collectively. But if they oppose each other, they're, they're worse off collectively. And there's an equilibrium condition that settles in um, as to the right place to be that, that everyone is better off and no one's worse off by selling into a common price. It's called a Pareto optimal condition. And if you've seen a movie with Russell Crowe, A Beautiful Mind, uh, he won, John Nash won the Nobel Prize for coming up with that. He won the Nobel Prize for economics, even though he was a mathematician, for coming up with this idea that, that actors should be able to, to cooperate and arrive at a stable equilibrium price without competition. And uh, obviously, there are some, forget the legal issues around that, but it is, but it's got all kinds of implications as well. It's used in the criminal law for bargaining or plea, plea bargains. All kinds of implications that are used a lot of other places uh, in, in the world as well. So it's the Nash equilibrium is something that, that if you are reading about it, at least you'll have a bit of an idea. I don't, you know, I, I only talk about it just real briefly here because it's not something I want to cover a lot in this uh, course. Okay. All right. So questions about oligopoly. We didn't, I, I know I, I sort of went over some, some ground I covered before. I realized I did that, but sometimes I just think that you know, toward the end of the cement, I, I want to make sure that toward the end of the class, I want to make sure that we're not uh, pushing uh, too quickly. I do want to talk about um, chapter 10 flows naturally into chapter 11, which deals with this trust, okay? Now, let's talk a bit about antitrust and what it is. I've, I've mentioned it a bit before. And by the way, this slide package is in last week's, uh, this is still in the week nine. And once I got, a, I was going to have a little better understanding of where we're going to be this week. And I could post the slide package for extra dollars. I'll probably do that. If not tonight, it'll be before class on, on Wednesday, but, but this is already up there. So you just go to, to the week nine module. So what is the antitrust all about? And what does this term come from? Well, first of all, it's antitrust law, which obviously it's a body of law. It's a, it's a you know, of all about you know, lawyers who specialize in antitrust. There's a division within the Justice Department that focuses on antitrust. But what is antitrust? And, and more, I guess, more specifically, what does the term trust mean? So it goes way, way back to the late 19, late 1800s, when in the early stages of the Industrial Revolution, when firms were buying each other up. And we talked about this example of Standard Oil as being almost the perfect exemplar of, of a firm that became a monopoly power by buying up other firms in what we call the horizontal part of the market. That is, firm A, B, C, D, they would simply go out stopping them up. They weren't interested in necessarily the vertical aspects of it. They weren't interested in drilling. They weren't interested in pipelines. They weren't interested in, in, in gas stations. Obviously, they, they branched off into some of those later, but they were mostly interested in refiners. So, but here's the thing, that the law would not allow firms to buy corporations outside of the state in which they were chartered. So they simply made this little uh, legal artifice that said, okay, we're not going to own you. We're simply uh, putting our shares together in, in a form of trust, which is, a trust exists today. It's, it's simply some sort of legal arrangement, usually a confidential arrangement. And that's what essentially the trust is. And to break these big powers up, a series of antitrust acts were passed by Congress. There are two that are most notable. There are others as well. 
There's the you know, there's the the Clayton Kefau the Seller Kefauver Act, and there are others as well. But this is the big one here, the Sherman Act of, of 1890. And the language on this was fairly vague. It said it prevents the formation of monopolies and actions taken in restricted trade. And I put that in quotes because that's the legal, that's the language in the statute itself. So what is what does the antitrust seek to do in the first place? It tries to break up monopoly power and to limit the power of, of big concentrated firms. The Sherman Act was really the first to do that. It was the idea that we would break up monopolies or any kind of action that's in a restricted trade. Well, here's the problem with the, the term in restricted trade. It's pretty vague, isn't it? And what does it mean? And so antitrust law is really more, it, it, and I try to avoid the legal um, details of this because I'm not a lawyer, I'm not trained in this, but I know that a lot of these definitions had to be sorted out in the courts over time as the government took to court various actors who were considered to be acting in restrictive trade. And that's really the courts that have decided what is an action in restrictive trade. Some are considered in restrictive trade, some are not, okay? So oftentimes, it, and, and sometimes courts are different in their definition of what interestrative trade means. So a few years ago, um, Home Depot bought a, a company that made mini blinds. And, you know, obviously Home Depot is a big home improvement retailer, and they sell mini blinds and a lot of, a lot of other stuff. But they wanted to buy the company that, that, owned that, that made the mini blinds, and then they turned off Lowe's, Lowe's, they wouldn't sell the Lowe's. So this is a pop, I forget the name of the mini blind, it doesn't really matter, but and then they just said, okay, now we own the mini, we're not going to sell Lowe's. And so you can't buy those mini blinds at Lowe's. You've got to come to Home Depot if you want to buy them because we own the company. The question was, is that an action in restraint of trade? And the government found that it was not an action in restraint of trade. And the reason why is because it's not, it's not the only maker of mini blinds out there. If you want to buy mini blinds, just buy a different brand. If you want to buy that brand, then pay the price, you know. But they're not preventing the demand side from obtaining mini blinds. And they're not and they're not preventing anybody from starting up a new company to make many blinds. It's not like that. So and, and so that, but those would be examples of restraint of trade. If I prevented you from starting up a, a new company, uh, that might be an action in restraint of trade. So the, what the Sherman Act did, and by the way, it took a good oh 20 years or so before they really moved on standard oil and um and 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 sought to break it up. Now remember, I, I, I gave you the slide about these two historical examples of, of monopolies, Standard Oil and Microsoft. And I, I said at the time that re I realized that those are really two uh, really crazy examples because they were formed about a hundred years apart. They wanted deals in the very high-tech uh, uh, business, the other very low-tech business. One sells a commodity, the other sells uh, a very customized good. But nonetheless, they did, they had some commonalities in the sense that number one, they were very high profile targets of the government. And the government sought to really limit their power because they had over a 90% market share in that particular good which they were going after. In Standard Oil's cases, it was refining of oil. In Microsoft's case, it was desktop operating systems. And that's really what they were after. Not that they, Microsoft didn't do other things because they did. They had other products. But that was what they were mostly concerned about because operating systems are pretty much something we all use on a daily basis. And they wanted a little bit more competition to happen. And remember... The judge, and I think I mentioned this, the judge initially at one point made a ruling that Microsoft was to be broken up. And a lot of people, like sure, like Standard Oil was, and a lot of people would scratch their heads saying, how do you break up a company with intellectual property? You know, it's one thing to break up, you know, you have refineries in this state, this state, this state, break them up and set up separate companies and whatnot, but how do you do it with software? That didn't obviously end up sticking. And I, I really think, and I mentioned this before, Judge simply didn't know what he had on his hands. I think it was it was way too complicated of a case. And frankly, Microsoft dragged that trial out for years and years and years. I think really just kind of wore the government down to the point where it, it, when it, it left the Justice Department of the Clinton administration, got carried over to the, the Justice Department of the succeeding administration, and they tried to keep it going. And finally, I think ended up settling it. And I know Microsoft was all the worse for wear. Uh, and then again, you know, with Standard Oil, let's talk about that. There was something called the Clayton Act, which came in a bit later, that sought to deal with a, a, pro a particular problem that nobody saw happening. If the Sherman Act, and this is pretty much what the, 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 the summation, what formation of monopolies and actions in restraint of trade. And one of the things that was unforeseen was this. Let's say you take Standard Oil, this giant, giant uh, monopoly called Standard Oil, and you break it up. You simply break it up and you have different pieces going different places. And so 
ESO, which is basically a play on the letters ESO, it was Stanwell, New Jersey. And then you had, um, uh, let's see, you had Mobile, which uh, went in one direction. You had Chevron, which I believe was the California aspect of it. And you had So Ohio. You had, a, you had like 37 different companies. You had Amico and as well. And there, there are a bunch of these that went into this, but they were all broken up. Okay. So that sounds like an interesting issue, right? Let's break these companies up and now they're competing companies. Ah, but here's the problem. When they did that, nobody thought that, hey, who are the, who's the owner of, who's the majority owner of, of Standard Oil? John D. Rockefeller. Well, John D. Rockefeller now simply had ownerships and even bigger percentage ownerships in these many smaller firms, John D. Rockefeller all the way across. So as a result, they really weren't competing firms at all. In other words, they had what were called interlocking directorates. And that is the idea that what is the point of having competing firms when the same people are running the firms? That makes no sense whatsoever. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence, economic historians are saying, there's a lot of evidence that, that Standard Oil was so far out on the, on the, on the curve, and they were probably already at diseconomies of scale. And so cutting this back meant they probably ended up getting experiencing lower costs and more cost efficiencies. And they probably were easier to manage being smaller, even though they were owned by the same, the same parties. And Johnny Rockefeller became even wealthier, as did Henry Flagler and a lot of the others that, that went along uh, with that particular um, enterprise, which you know today would be considered a conspiracy. In those days, it was, it was legal, but because it wasn't illegal. I mean, a lot of things are now illegal that weren't that weren't illegal, but you know, they, when they formed a monopoly, it wasn't particularly illegal. And then breaking it up really didn't do much about it. So in other words, it set up this idea of what was called interlocking directorates. The Clayton Act sought to remove that, that idea. The other thing, there are two, two things with interlocking directorates that were discovered in this time. Number one was this issue where if you've got interlocking directorates basically means you cannot sit on the board of directors, which is the governing body of a corporation and also sit on the competing board because that's considered to be a violation of the Clayton Act. So, um, so you can't sit on the board of GM and Ford. You can't do that. You can't sit on the board of, of, uh, of Northrop Grumman and uh, Martin Marietta, or uh, whatever that's called now, um, Lockheed Martin, I guess that's what it's called. You can't sit on these competing boards because it's considered to be a conflict of interest. You can't sit on the board of Pfizer and also on the board of, of Glaxo. So that's what's meant by an interlocking directory. And there's another thing that was going on with interlocking directorates, and something that um, is a much less told story, but it's one that I think if you really, if you like intrigue and you like economic espionage and, and industrial spying and industrial espionage, uh, the banker J.P. Morgan for many years had, I guess agents is the word, who would get themselves on boards around the country, find out what boards were doing, and then and, and communicating information to him so that he would know how to invest if they're playing a new product or they get a new breakthrough or they're going to buy another company, they would know. And so all this idea of feeding information, particularly among competing firms, and so they would know which horse to back, in other words. And that would be an example of an interlocking director. And that is uh, sharing information back and forth. That's illegal. So the idea of, of talking about secret deliberations within boards. And by the way, just a few years ago during the financial crisis, um, one of the Goldman Sachs directors was, I mean, Goldman Sachs is a major, major investment firm left a meeting of Goldman Sachs and got on the phone with somebody and told them to do something. I forget, based upon what he heard confidentially in, in that, he got in some serious trouble for doing that as a result. Uh, but but it's, not all, but it's not always people up to no good. Interlocking directorates can happen just because of acquisitions, because of spinoffs. There was one example where uh, Eric Schmidt, who was the former CEO of Google, also was a board member of, of Apple, at the time, they were, they were, so it was on both boards, Google and Apple. And at the time, they were really separate entities. Google did this, was over here, search mostly, and that was really what they were doing. Apple was hardware and software, but now they're kind of converging, and, and they're doing more of both things. And so Eric Schmidt resigned from the board of Apple because he, he didn't want to get uh, involved in the Clayton Act violation. And so he just simply resigned, and I think that was probably uh, on the advice of counsel. So that's what the Clayton Act sought to do, is to try to, to get out of this issue here, which was an unintended consequence. Sometimes laws are passed and nobody really thinks about, hey, what are the consequences going to be? Okay? Also, tying arrangements um, were prohibited by the, by the Clayton Act. So what's a tying arrangement? Tying arrangement basically says, okay, I um, tire, so me, I'm a Firestone tire. Hey, you're my tires. You're also going to buy um, wheel wells, right? We're going to make both. We're going to make you buy them. 
I don't want wheel wells. Well, if you're going to buy Firestone tires, you're, we're going to make you buy wheel wells or whatever the case might be. If you're going to buy electronic wheels, you're also going to buy steering wheels. I mean, you get the idea. It's the idea that, that there is a, a requirement to buy one product and, and not the other. And, and tying arrangements make sense for sellers. They do it all the time. We see this every day if we go to a fast food restaurant. What's one, what's one tying arrangement you see all the time? Every time you go to a fast food restaurant, what is one giant tying arrangement? Number one, well, super size or number one, number two, number three. You've got to buy a bundle of goods, right? It's a bundle of goods. Maybe you didn't want that. Maybe you wanted, maybe you walked in, you just wanted a hamburger or french fries. But then they, they will always try to get you to buy. Now, they won't force you because that's probably a violation, but they'll they'll try to encourage you. And sometimes they'll give you a discount on the goods within the bundle, but that's an example of time. And you know, it's the idea of, of trying to get you to buy more than one good uh, as opposed to just buying what it is that you want to buy. So that's the example of a, of a tying arrangement. Yeah? So antitrust law basically deals with this idea of trying to break up market power. So what about market power? And let's talk about this and I'll spend some time getting into market power. I think that'll be sort of the last thing we talk about today. So when we talk about market power, what are we, what are we defining it as? So we're defining it as the ability of firms do things which are detrimental to the demand side because they put so much power on the supply side. Remember something I said last week, and it, it, it really is a feature of American society. It's maybe it's not perhaps unique to America, but it certainly does define ours. That is, we value competition on the supply side much more than we value um, uh, cooperation. And not all cultures are the same. We know that the Japanese economy tolerates much more of this idea of firms that are linked together. But we do not like Mitsubishi, for instance, offers so many different products across so many different categories, as does Sony and as does Yamaha, just in completely different industries. Um, and also has, you know, uh, arrangements going all the way back to raw materials, intermediate goods, distribution, and all that. But we value competition as just part of our, our, our legal structure that sort of maybe flows out of our, our own interpretation of how people should be allowed to behave and that people should be protected from the abuses of, of others. And so there, there are really three approaches. The first two are really inadequate. The first is just simply taking a market share approach. And we have taking the average, the average market share and saying, okay, this is the degree of what's the problem with this? The problem is we go back to this general problem with averages generally. Okay. I talked about this some time ago that there's a problem with averages, and that is the idea that if you've got one. Excuse me, one outlier, it really pushes the average in directions that may not be representative of any firm in that particular industry. If you have one firm with a 90% market share and everybody else has got 1%, then you're going to get some average of the extremely high values. And that high value is not going to represent anybody, not even the biggest firm. So averages are difficult. So you can't just look at market share alone. And some people are tempted to only look at market share, and that's a mistake. So there's something called the four firm concentration ratio. And that's better, but it's still inadequate. And here it only focuses on the first, on the top four firms in the industry and says, okay. And again, this magic number four keeps coming up because it seems like four is where we sort of allow firms to get concentrated. We're not saying there are no industries that have fewer, but four does seem to be natural if you've got many more to start out with. So you're taking the collective market shares and simply summing them, that's all you're doing. And I'll give you an example here in a minute as to why that is considered to be inadequate. That just simply doesn't work as an example of how to measure and control market share, okay? And, and market power. And the third one is much better. It's called the Herfindahl Hirschman Index. It's been around for about 100 years. Two economists of the same uh, names. And it takes the market power by accounting for the impact of large firms. The way it does it, it takes the market share percentages, takes them as integers. And so if you have a 20% market share, you just drop the, the percentage, make 20, and you square that value. Now, what does it mean to square a value? It means you magnify the importance of that value. And then you simply add up, it's a sum of squares approach. You simply add up the squared values. When I say taking these integers, you simply take, you know, 5% market share, you just drop the 5%. You drop the percent, 5, and square it, you get 25 and then you have a, a uh, you end up with a value somewhere between zero, which is probably not possible, 
because how do you have zero market? Somebody would have to have zero market share or something zero squared. That doesn't even make sense to have zero more. Uh, and then uh, and, and zero and 10,000. 10,000 would assume there's one firm 100% market share. 100 squared is 10,000. So it's some continuum between zero and 10,000. So all you're really doing is you're saying, okay, big firms are going to push this value much higher than small firms are. Because think about this, if you have 100 firms of 1% market share in the market, simply square those, one squared is one, and then add them all together, you get 100. Between zero and 10,000, 100 is a fairly small distance. You're very, very close to zero. And so we would say that is not a particularly concentrated industry. And by the way, if that sounds like an absurd example, think about perfect competition. We can say this about almost any producer of perfect competition, whether it's commercial fishermen, whether it's farmers, whether it's grain farmers, cattle farmers, dairy farmers, almost any kind of um, uh, producer that has a tiny market share. That's why we're not particularly worried about all producers in perfect competition getting together and agreeing because there's so many of them that wouldn't even make sense or it wouldn't even be possible. And they couldn't do it without creating some sort of news anyway. So we're not worried about very small, tiny market shares. It's the big market shares that are what cause all of the trouble. And so let's get into some of the examples here. And, and again, you can see some of this on the, the PowerPoint package, but I wanna show you some examples of what these look like and, and why particularly CR4 is problematic, the, the, the concentration ratio four index. And then we'll get into how the Herpendal is used and, um, and why it's important. I'm gonna bring the lights up here so that everybody can see, including the people watching on the video. And so, so I've got some scenarios, okay? And I want to take, I'll just say we've got, okay, different market situations. And when I say situations, I'm just simply saying these are different market arrangements and um, uh, we're going to call them A, B, C, and D. Okay, so let's take the CR4 ratio first and then we'll see why there are some shortcomings because it's one thing for me to tell you there's shortcomings. Maybe it's easier for me to show you that there are some shortcomings. So let's say we've got one industry connection here and we've got, We'll call that for uh, industry A, and we've got firm one, and firm two, I just, I'll just keep one, three, four, five, six. And we've got relative market shares here of 25%. Uh, let me put the glasses out here so we can see. Uh, 20%, 10%, 5%, 30%, so that's the biggest player in there, and 10%. So, so if you notice, they add up, they should have up to 100%. Okay, they should have up to 100%. They add up 45, 60. Yes, they add up to 100%. Okay, let's take uh, scenario B here. Okay, and see what that looks like. Here we've got uh, fewer firms. We've got one, two, three, and four. And here we're saying that we've got a market share identical across the board 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%. They add up to 100, obviously. Okay, and then we've got and then we've got C here. I'm sorry, I'm running a little bit out of room. And so here we've got 25%, um, 15%, 15%, and 45%. Okay? And those should add up to 100. But here's the thing. Okay, here, here are where the shortcomings lie with regard to the CR4 ratio. So... Let's say you've got, if you've got 100 firms, you just simply take out 96 and you take the top four market shares and you simply add them and then somehow arrive at some idea of how concentrated that industry is. So here we would simply kick out these two, or we add them together, 45, 50, as a concentration ratio. That is, these, this industry is, is, has, has 85%, okay? All right, so that sounds like it's pretty highly concentrated, but what about this? Add the first, there are only four, and so you get them together, you get a 100%. And so what does that tell you? You've got this, it seems like it's more concentrated than this because it's got a higher value. But this is actually more competitive because you've got more competitors, and you've got some with some market share that they're surviving with much, much smaller. The distance between, um, and this is revenue, or that's what market share is, revenue for the firm divided by revenue of the industry. Uh, you've got one that's six times bigger. The biggest is six times bigger than the smallest. And so you've got actually quite a lot of diversity here. And yet it seems like that's a fairly high ratio. But here you've got much more even playing field. So how can you have a dominant player in what looks like a very heavily concentrated industry? 
Likewise, here you've got one dominant player, but these also end up to 100%. So what do these numbers actually mean? You've got really contradictory information being, being said here. You've got industry A that looks like it's uh, it's pretty highly concentrated, but, but it's actually got quite a lot of diversity. B has got very little diversity, but a huge amount of concentration. But in fact, the diversity here may be a good thing because there's no one dominant player. Here you've got diversity and that same high ratio, but there's there's one extremely dominant player. And as a result, that's not even playing. But how do you compare these values for this and this when they look quite different? They look quite different. So, these, so that ratio doesn't really help us very much, does it? It doesn't really point us the way and, and say, well, you know, that we, if we just take the top four producers. And it's even less helpful when we get big industries that are moving their way down to four producers. And, and I think that that number of four is becoming uh, more critical all the time. So let's take a look at the Herpendahl index. And we're going to see them end up at different values and therefore different uh, interpretations of what those values mean. Okay. So let's come over to this board here and let's get into some examples of Herpendahl Hirschman index values. Oops. Okay. So let's, and I'll take the same examples that I gave above on the left side there. I'll take uh, the A, B, and C examples. Okay. So let's go I'll try to try to get this in here without trying to squeezing it. So we've got firm A or firm one, I guess I should say. Same, same percentages, 25%, 20%, 10%, 5%, 30, 10%. Okay. And then here in B, we've got uh 25, 25, 25, and 25. C, we've got the same again, 25, 15, 15, and 45. Okay, all right. So all I'm doing is simply copying that over. Well, let's compute the Herfindahl ratio on these. And so remember, what do we do? We take the squared market share percentages taken as integers. And so with A, we've got 25. We drop the percentage, simply square it. By, square, by squaring anything, we magnify, we exponentiate the value. That's why we're doing that plus 20%, plus 10%, plus 5%, plus 30%. I'm sorry, square, I should say. No, I shouldn't say percent, but it's squared. 25 squared, 20 squared, squared all the way across, 30 squared, plus 10 squared. So we end up with what here? So it's 625 plus 400 plus 100 plus 25 plus 900 plus 100. And so the value is 1,340. Okay. Now, right now, remember the H, the Herfindahl index runs from zero to ten thousand. Okay. Well, I'm going to put zero to ten thousand. So, right now, okay, what does that mean? One thousand three. Let's not worry so much about it right now. Okay. This is what the Herfindahl runs from at zero percent market share gives you zero, which is not logical. So it's got to be something above zero. So it's it's zero less than. 10,000, somewhere in that range. And I guess you I guess it's less than or equal to because you're going to have one firm with 100% market share. Let's do scenario B here and see what that ends up with and, and tells us you know, where we end up here. So here we simply add up the numbers we get. And I'm going to try to squeeze this in here because I'm sort of low on board space. I'm taking the market shares as integers and squaring them. And here I get a value of 3,100. 3,100 is the value on this particular industry. Now, notice this is higher. And what we're saying is, obviously you can't get any higher than 100% market share. And by squaring that, you get to 100. Or by squaring that, you get to 10,000. So the closer you get to 10,000, the more concentrated you are. But notice there's one value here that sort of pushes everything over the top. And that's this guy here, 45 squared is 2,025. So two thirds of the points in this measure come from that one firm. This is why the Herpidol index is useful because it tells, it, it reflects the domination of one firm in the industry. It reflects industry domination of one firm. And by the way, this is gonna trip alarm bells and be, and be a problem. Uh, let's do one, one other one here and let's take these. Um, oh wait, you know what? I think I did this. This should be C, I'm sorry. I, I, I got my, uh, this should be C. And then let's go to B here. And B is simply 25 squared. 25 squared times four, basically, and you get 2,500, okay? So it's still high because you've got, 25 squared is 625. So it's still high, but it's not as high as this. So this is, and by the way, this is also more, um, this is more 
egalitarian, you could say. There's more equal market share. So you've got a lower value. That might not be quite as an issue as this one industry that's got 45% uh, market share. That's where we really started to get in trouble there. So let's give some example here of what, uh, what we're talking about in terms of, of what the concerns are. And I, I've got, to, I think I forgot to pull up here during the, <clears throat> oops, during the break here. Let me pull up for you the, um, the, um, the DOJ, uh, the, the Department of Justice's own uh, metrics for how they measure these. Okay, so here it is. So this is, and I'll scroll the camera over here so you can see it. This is the U.S. Department of Justice, and they are concerned with the Herfindahl Index. And so if you notice here that they are talking about Herfindahl Indexes uh, being between 1,500 and 25,000 as being moderately concentrated. So between zero and 1,500, not concentrated, okay? Not concentrated. I'm hoping that, that the, let me scroll the camera over here so, you, so that the viewers watching can see it. And I'll try to bring that website up here. I hope you guys can see on the video there. Oh, you, no, you can't. Oh, let me bring it over here. I think you can't see. There you go. I apologize for that. It's kind of hard. We've got two different screens going on here. I'm trying to sort of toggle back and forth. So if you, if you see here between zero and 1,500, no, no problem. Between 1,500 and 2,500, moderately concentrated. And therefore, there, there does require some, uh, some analysis. And then anything over 2,500 becomes what is called highly concentrated. So you've got really two industries here that are considered to be fairly highly concentrated. So um, now initially what happens is there's the agency of the government, and your text gets into this, called the Federal Trade Commission, that will first look at these and look at industries to try to understand what's happening. And they can file lawsuits against companies. They can, they can block mergers and acquisitions and firms try to get together and try to so it's emerged, they can say, no, you're, 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 uh, uh, the FTC can say, no, we're not going to allow it. And by the way, there's something called horizontal merger guidelines. What horizontal means is just like the way I presented market shares there. It's firms in the same line of, of production. So if you take the auto industry, we're not interested in the, the market for car batteries. We're talking about the market for cars. So car batteries are one component. If, if Ford made all the components, they went all the way back to making tires and, and batteries and electronics and furniture inside the car, then that would be a vertical situation. But that's, no one's, that's not as big a concern because it's a little bit harder and a little bit less desirable for firms to control production all the way from start to finish and the production for good. Yes, we know there are Japanese firms that do that and it's, and it's sort of part of that accepted uh, uh, legal system, but not so much here. Most firms don't want to do that. Instead, they would rather though control the horizontal situation is firm buying, firm A buying, firm B, et cetera. And so as a result, these guidelines are what um, are used to sort of uh, to make these decisions. And by the way, there was an interesting, I think I, I found this as I was looking over the leaking um, about some, some upcoming hearings and trials. And so notice that the, the, the Department of Justice, see the FTC can't, they can take people to court in a civil matter, but they can't sue people or they can't prosecute people because the only prosecutory authority is the Justice Department that the U.S. is now. This is the hearing against Google. And so I had mentioned the fact that we haven't had a major, major, major agency. I mean, because look at these. I mean, who is Info Keep? I don't know who that is. Or Bill Miller. I mean, yes, there are actors out there that nobody has ever heard of. But we've all heard of Google. This is probably the first big action. United States versus Google. We're going to see how that, how that shakes out. First hearing scheduled for April 13th. And, you know, again, we haven't really seen any major antitrust action against the firm in a good 25 years since the, uh, the Microsoft uh, situation. So this is the Department of Justice going after Google in a prosecutorial way. And we're going to see what happens with, with Google. And, and um, I think it's interesting. The rest of these data, I don't, I've never heard of them. I don't think anybody else has. But it kind of gives you an idea of the fact that the Justice Department does have a division that is active in this particular area and going after uh, firms that have High, high market share. High market share, and the high market share then leads to potential abuses of power. And one of those abuses of power is, is to what's to stop firm A from buying, uh, let's say, firm B, or, or, one, two, or, a, or firm one from buying firm five here, right? So then you have 25 plus 30, which is 55% market share. That's really going to tip the needle. And that's just one, one combination among 
all kinds of different combinations. And so they would prevent that. So again, between what is it, zero and 1250, I think, I think they said zero. These numbers, by the way, have changed over the years because it used to be for years that they were interested in 1800 was sort of a magic number. And I think now they're, they're more interested in uh, 1500. So zero to 1500, not concentrated. So your herpendol index is not pushing things up. So not concentrated. So if you're an industry, again, perfect competition, you might have 100 as a value, not a problem, between 1500 and 2500, moderately concentrated. This is where they look very carefully and they will have, they've been known, the government has, to turn down merger requests when these indexes become too high. And if anything over 2500 is, is considered to be highly concentrated in there, you get into issues in which you've got some real antitrust concerns. And by the way, what's really interesting is the fact that I think a lot of us did not find out how the courts were interpreting the, the Sherman Act itself, the Microsoft trial, but apparently the court said, look, it's not illegal to be a monopoly. It's not illegal to be a monopoly. Contrary to what the Sherman Act expressly says, it's illegal to be for monopoly formation. The courts have, have increasingly said it's not illegal to become a monopoly. It's illegal to do things to maintain a monopoly. Other things that maintain your monopoly position. And by the way, this was Bill Gates's defense back in the late 90s. He's saying, look, I can't help it that we're a monopoly in operating systems. He goes, I'm as surprised as anybody. Because I would have thought by now that there would have been competing firms, you know, like Apple. Apple did have an operating system, but it wasn't a very tiny market share. Um, you, you had Linux systems, which, in the, yeah, they're ubiquitous in the business world and in government and research, but they're not people that really have them at their homes usually. Most businesses don't. But he would say, look, I would have thought some microsystems, which is now part of Oracle, would have operating system. Yeah, they didn't. So in other words, I can't help that we're so awesome, in other words, and we have monopoly. And the government's saying, yes, you're right. But the problem, Microsoft, is that you are, it's not that just that you're just awesome and nobody can compete. You're also doing the kind of things that won't allow people to compete because you're pressuring distributors downstream, that is, in this vertical chain here, um, that is hardware makers to put your products on. And you're also engaging in time because they're also saying you've got to put the Internet Explorer browser. You can't have Internet Explorer browser unless you use uh, the Windows operating system. Now, obviously, they're saying that the two products are integral and everybody who knows software is saying they're not integral. But Microsoft was trying to make that argument. And it was an unusual argument because they're saying that we are tying this good together only not because it's a tying violation, but because they go together. The, the products are inseparable. And of course, you know, people can use all kinds of browsers. And we know now that all kinds of browsers you can use and, and, and use the internet or the end of MS Windows. It's not a particular problem. So that argument didn't work very well, but it was a very complicated case. And I'm really interested to see how the thing with Google shakes out because the Attorney General himself came out and talked about all these areas in which Google is trying to dominate in the area of search, in the area of search. That's what that's their that's their problem. It's not about physical hardware, it's not about but even not software, it's about search. And uh, that's the real issue there, okay? All right, one final thing. We're, we're sort of running a bit low on time, but not really. And that is this. Okay, so I've talked a lot about Microsoft. And it's it's and I talked about it because it's, one, it's a product we all know and we're all familiar with. And I, I know there was a lot of questions at the time about how can Microsoft be a monopoly when there are other competing products out there? And remember that we talked about the fact that you can still maintain a monopoly even with a 90% market share because, you know, you've got such a dominant position that the little actors don't really push the needle at all. And, let's, and I've mentioned that I've, I've talked about this firm pushing the needle before. Let's talk about what that is. So Microsoft, by the late 90s, had a 90% market share in operating systems. And we don't know what the relative market shares were of the other competing products like a Apple. And all the Linux press. Let's just even let's just say that it was fairly large, even, and let's say it was one firm with with ten percent market share. If you square these, we end up with eighty one hundred plus one hundred. We have an index value. Got out of on that one. We have an index value of eighty two hundred, and that is off the charts. This is why Microsoft was a target, and I know a lot of people were saying, "Why is Microsoft?" Being a scapegoat. Why are, why are they being targeted for success? Because they're so good at what they do and that because everyone wants to tear them down. No, it's because of the fact they had such a dominant position 
8,100 of those points. And by the way, it doesn't really matter. Let's say it's 1% squared and it says 10, it's 8,110. It's still off the charts. It makes no difference. These guys here don't make any difference really in terms of the herpetol at all. Just like 100 farmers or 1,000 farmers don't push the needle either. Not that they're not important, but they're not important from a, a legal and regulatory standpoint. But this figure here, 90% squared, 8,100, it just in its own right, is the vast bulk of this number, and it's way above 1,500, way above 2,500 even. So as a result, this is sort of a glaring beacon sign. So whenever you have industries that are hugely concentrated like that, you know, you're going to have warning bells go off in the federal government. The FTC is the primary agency that will look at it, but then... If, they, if there's a criminal violation, particularly a violation of the various acts, and we talked about the Sherman Act, the Clayton Act, there are others as well that have come down over time, then it could be a criminal matter. And again, as you might know from even accounting or any business classes, corporations can be charged with crimes. Yeah, obviously, you can't send a, a corporation to prison, but they can be fined, they can be they can have restrictions placed upon what they can do, all kinds of sanctions placed against them. They can be broken up in some cases. Uh, in this, so we'll see what happens with Google. I think that's an interesting thing to look at. But this is one explanation for why Microsoft just was sort of this bright beacon, why they, why they, the government felt like they had to go after them. And whenever you see gigantic market shares like this, you're going to see it. Now, again, this is not really, just like in a case of oligopoly, where we said we have a few competing firms, but it really wouldn't mean four veterinarians in a small town. Well, it also wouldn't mean one tire store in um, in Berlin, for instance, or or Hobbs, or it wouldn't mean one pet groomer in um, some very tiny place. I mean, that that does not constitute that. That is not really the, the purpose here, because obviously, yes, they may have the ability to charge monopoly power, but it's not going to attract the federal government's attention. And by the way, what are what are you supposed to do if you're the only tire store? Are you supposed to then create a competing firm you know, in order to compete against yourself? Why would you do that? That doesn't even make any sense. So no, that, there's no sense in going after those small monopolies, which is why we say monopolies are, for the most part, local phenomena, where they exist, and they exist in from, from these small out-of-the-way areas of the, there's only one gas station, one general store, whatever, one 7-Eleven, um, and also uh, natural monopolies, and we allow those to exist for reasons that we can regulate them very, very heavily. But when these unregulated monopolies get going, they become really a target of government intervention. Okay, so questions about antitrust. There's a lot going on in antitrust. A lot of it really gets into to the law. I mean, I, I find it interesting, not being a lawyer, but I find it interesting that the courts have sort of changed their interpretation of antitrust over time uh, to actually say that you can actually accommodate a monopoly if you can uh, if that monopoly is not trying to prevent others from preventing other, preventing others from starting out. Okay, so that does it. So we have gotten through 10 and 11 today. So when we come back on Wednesday, we'll get into some other areas that will deal with externalities. And we'll cover that beginning Wednesday and into next week. So I will see everybody on Wednesday.